Okay, everybody, here we go. We're going to wrap it up. But before our last presentation, we have some special people to thank. And let's start with the county extension agents out there. Um, these are very busy people, and we want to thank them for spending four Monday nights to bring the Spring Fever Garden Forums to their county. And greatly appreciated. Um, also, we, we need to thank Bob Birch. Bob is an incredible person, a pleasure to work with, and just as a matter of fact, this program would not work with, with, without Bob. He is just a master. He makes all this happen, and just thank you, Bob, so much. Um, lastly, let's talk about the evaluation. Is that It's very important that we evaluate the Spring Fever Garden Forums. Um, all the speakers and Bob and I were very interested in your comments. We think the Spring Fever Garden Forums is a special program, and but we're striving to make it as great as possible. And so we value your comments. So the county agents, for the people out in the counties, the county agents have an evaluation form that they can pass out to you. And please complete that tonight before you leave. Or if you're too busy to complete it tonight, you can see a web address at the top of that form and you can go online sometime over the next couple weeks and complete the form online. For those of you who are joining us from home uh, tomorrow, anybody who had registered to take the program online, I'll send you the link to the, to the online evaluation form. And again, we value your comments. It's very important for us. Okay. So let's wrap it up here. And a lot of us know about the importance of honeybees in our garden, but there's lots of beneficial insects out there. And here to show us how to enhance the populations of beneficial insects is Travis Prochaska. Travis is a crop protection specialist based out of the North Central Research and Extension Center in Minot. So Travis. Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we've got two great presentations already tonight, so hopefully I can add another one into that. Every time I'm asked to talk about entomology, there's always one thing that jumps off to uh, the screen to me that I just have in a passion to talk about, and that is probably going to be pollinators. But here in the U.S., we have a different outlook on what I think about insects. So an example, this was yesterday, I was actually out south of Minot working with 4-Hers and I said, what is the first word you think of when I use the word insect? And I'm sure you can guess what I'm going to say. It was things like yuck, disgusting, squash it, uh, kill it. Uh, that's just kind of the outlook we kind of have across uh, the United States, but they kept the power to do such good things for us, whether it's helping with pollination or even being beneficial insects in the garden. And I want you to kind of get into some of that today. When I think about pollinators, I'm guessing the honeybee is probably one of the top two insects across the country that most people are familiar with. Really, the only one that's probably most known over that is probably the monarch butterfly. So today, I wanted to step back from the honeybee and kind of introduce to you some other members uh, of your garden community that maybe you're not thinking about or interacting with. One of the most known uh, native bee species is probably that of the bumblebee. Uh, not many realize that the honeybee is actually not native of the United States. It came over during colonization times, of course, them being native to Western Europe and Africa. The bumblebee is most identifiable by recognizing that robust kind of wide hairy body, if you will. One of the benefits that they have, they have really strong wing muscles. Uh, so that allows them to be strong flyers. You can see they can travel up to a mile uh, in distance if needed. One of the other benefits they have though is I'm thinking of tomatoes. How many of you probably grow tomatoes in your garden? I'm considering probably quite a bit few of you. When I think of tomatoes, they have pretty small flowers overall, and that pollen is held really tight. So not any pollinator can come up and pollinate that. They need to be able to dislodge that pollen from that uh, plant or that flower. So those strong, powerful wing muscles will begin to move really rapidly. You kind of get that buzzing sound that you accustomed with the bumblebee. That helps dislodge some of that pollen. 
Uh, I know in the last few years we saw the introduction of one uh, bumblebee species onto the endangered species list. Uh, that's actually one of them from the southwestern part of the country, but that has begged the question, could others get there someday? And if that does happen, are we ready to counteract that? And I know, I think it's Monsanto. They've been playing around with the tool. They call it the tomato tickler. Uh, think about a little fork. It kind of goes up between the uh, flower and they get it to vibrate really rapidly. Uh, they are seeing that it does work, just not as efficiently as some of the native bumblebees are doing. Uh, there are 20 species of bumblebee that call North Dakota home, and they're pretty medium to large in size, 10 to 23 millimeters. Uh, if you think about the conversion, so 23 millimeters would be 2.3 centimeters. Of course, going to an inch, 2.54 centimeters in an inch. So we're just saying an inch at full size. These are colony uh, bees. We're going to step into a second of solitary bees, but these are colony bees. They traditionally live in a colony of about 50 to 1,000 specimens, uh, really primarily made up of females. Uh, they typically have one queen there, but those females kind of uh, are in charge of that colony, if you will. They're going to forage for food. They're going to care for the larvae, the immature in that colony. And if needed, they're going to defend that colony in many instances if a predator uh, begins to bear down on that colony. Unlike the honeybee that we're accustomed to, these don't have that generic bee frame bee box that we see out in North Dakota farms. Uh, they live underground. They typically take over abandoned rodent burrows. Uh, because of that, they don't really store honey. Uh, so what does that colony look like at the end of the year? We actually see where that colony dies off with the exception of that newly fertilized queen. So I just wanted to give you a brief introduction of the bumblebee because we do interact with it. But now I want to turn down another path here and go with the solitary bees. These are probably not as recognizable to many of us working in the garden each and every day. And I'm sure some of these will jump out to you to be recognizable. Probably not all of them. First of all, they're not social. Uh, they tend to defend themselves, take care of themselves uh, in their environment. Uh, that's just kind of how they interact. They tend to have a rather short life cycle, uh, yielding one generation per year. They'll take care of their own nests. Uh, some of them live underground. In fact, I read that upwards of two thirds of solitary bees will actually live underground. They're not above ground dwellers. But with that being said, there are a few of those that do. Uh, I'm thinking of the mason bees, the leaf cutter bees, uh, some of which will use dead plant stems or that of small tree holes or cavities to take shelter. Across the state of North Dakota, 250 North Dakota uh, solitary bee species among 4,000 across the United States. So today, I want to kind of turn the page a little bit more. Let's get a little bit more specific. We're going to have two different uh, types of solitary bees I want to get into. That of the short tongue bees and that of the long tongue bees. So you're thinking about why do we have long uh, tongue and short tongue? I'm thinking about flowers and their adaptations. We have some flowers that are kind of shallow. We have deeper flowers where the nectar can't be reached to by a short tongue bee. So we see that adaptation to be able to feed on that nectar from some of those species. Uh, today we'll get with the short tongue bees, family adrenity, collectidae, and holectidae. Uh, I know those are scientific names. I'll get to the common names here in the next couple slides. Then we'll turn to the long tongue bees, uh, thinking of family apidae, uh, megachylidae. Uh, here, you do see family melodity being listed there. These are not really found in North Dakota. Uh, they tend to do be a good solitary pollinator, but because they're not really found here, we'll kind of leave them off the list today. Uh, but I did want to give them their due justice. So let's first <coughs> uh, start with family adrenity. I'm going to first start off with the mining bee species. So you'll see, recognize that specimen in that upper photo there. Uh, typically small to medium in size, really getting to about a centimeter and a half long. This is one of our ground dwellers. So think about those drier areas in the part of North Dakota. Uh, I consider us in the north central part of North Dakota, probably one of those drier climates uh, compared to that of the southeast corner of the state. Uh, think about the sandy soils. These are kind of the type of soils that they're going to grow in. Uh, oftentimes we can find that exit hole near shrubs. Um, oftentimes that's because think of the heating of the day. A hot area so they want to keep that entryway a little bit cooler uh, so that's just kind of when those uh, 
tidbits there to help understand why they do that. They tend to be generally black in color uh, with some pale hair stripes on the abdomen. Uh, so if I think about the specimen here, I always think of an insect with three body regions. So we have the head. This is going to have the eyes, the antennae, uh, and the mouth parts. We come to the thorax. This is where the legs and the wings are going to attach to the specimen. Then we have the abdomen. Of course, thinking about a bee or a wasp, this is where the overpositor, this is where the egg laying device or the stinger is going to be found. Uh, that overpositor egg laying device being that stinger in this instance. Uh, so we talked about the abdomen and the stripes. You see a good example of those three stripes on that abdomen there. Next, I want to come down to family holectidae. And this is one of my favorite ones to talk about. And I think it's because it doesn't necessarily fall into that same pattern as most bees. When I think about bees in general, uh, maybe wasps, I think the first thing that jumps to my mind is that black and yellow coloration. Uh, that's pretty common. This one really doesn't show that. In fact, it tends to be more of a metallic color. You can see in this instance, in this photo, it's more of a green metallic. They can come in brown metallic or black metallic, just as a few other examples. Uh, again, some of those light bandings taking place on that abdomen. These tend to be small to medium in size, again, really not reaching more than a centimeter and a half, and tend to nest uh, within the soil, uh, kind of like that mining bee we just talked about above. <coughs> Next, I want to turn to family collected E. I'm going to break this one into two different specimens here. Uh, there's actually more specimens that are attached to this, but these are some of the common ones that we interact with. First, we'll start with the cellophane bee. This is another ground dweller. Uh, once it gets underground, it has some of its ca uh, cavities, uh, some of those tunnels, if you will, uh, on the outlook. It actually will line that nest, that cavity, if you will, with the water per secretion. Uh, thinking about the saliva that it has, as it lines that, it'll begin to dry. It becomes cellophane-like, uh, hence the name cellophane B. The head, and I know this image is not really pointing towards us, but if he was facing our direction, you'd kind of see it almost as a heart-shaped like head. Okay. Uh, this body, really similar to the mining bee we talked about on the last page, rather dark and slender in appearance, and again with light bands of hair on the abdomen. Next we get to family collectedy. This is the mass bee. And really when you look at that photo there, it really gives you a good idea as to why we call it the mass bee. Uh, you see a little bit of that yellow on the face being shown, but you can see that black coloration covering up some of the eyes and so forth. This is one of the smaller ones I'm going to talk about today, really less than a centimeter long in most cases. Uh, this is actually going to be above ground. So this is going to occupy different cavity nests or hollow branches, thinking of reeds and stuff like that. This tends to be rather hairless. So if you look at the specimen above, the cellophane, notice how hairy this specimen really is. When I come down to the mass bee, really simple hair. It really doesn't have that much hair on it. Uh, that body tends to be kind of shiny in appearance and almost has a wasp-like shape. And when I'm thinking about the wasp, uh, I'm going to start a story here. I'll come back to it when I get to the wasp page. But we talked about the head, thorax, and abdomen on this slide. Right here, I want you to take notice. It's kind of wide, okay? It's kind of a wide connection in that waist between that thorax and abdomen. So kind of keep that in mind, and I'll talk about that again when we come back to the wasp part of this presentation. So now we can turn from the short tongue bees to the long tongue bees. Uh, the first slide here, we're going to have two uh, members of the family Megachylidae. Uh, of course, we're going to start off with the leaf cutting ants. Uh, I always like this photo here. Uh, you can understand why it gets that name, the leaf cutting name. You can just see that uh, cut that it's done on that specific uh, specimen. Again, another medium to large specimen occupying holes or cavities to serve as its nest. A pretty dark stat body. Uh, light gray hairs around that abdomen. Uh, one thing I want to point out with this specimen has more of a pointed abdomen. So this will come down to almost like a point on this specimen. The mason bees are pretty close relative. Uh, the leaf cutting bees, a little bit smaller, 5 to 15 millimeters in length. Again, living in a pre-made cavity. Uh, I always like this one too. I guess it follows in the same idea, family helictity, uh, the sweat bee we talked about. We don't really see that traditional black and yellow coloration, we get some of these blue, uh, green metallic colors, uh, if you will. So always one of those fancy specimens to find out in the landscaping area. 
next I want to turn to family aphidae. And before I get into these specimens, uh, we talked about the bumblebees at the start. This is also another member of family aphidae. Uh, so keep, kind of keep that in mind as we move through that. Uh, we'll first start with the European honeybee here. About uh, in, a centimeter and a half in length. Again, open cavity, so another above ground dwelling uh, specimen. This one tends to be a little bit more social than we talked about with some of the other solitary bees that really tend to themselves for the most part. Uh, this is going to have a golden body appearance, uh, pretty hairy uh, with that physical characteristic uh, with some of the dark brown legs. I really want to focus in on this leg here. So right here we call this the pollen basket. And when we think of about a basket, I think about something that can hold something smaller. That's exactly what I think about here. So you can see this basket. It's kind of spade shovel shaped, if you will, uh, made to hold things. I also notice strong hairs right here that kind of surround it. We, so this is going to be one of those areas on the bees that actually is going to collect uh, some of the grains of pollen, if you will, hold that to it so you can understand exactly how grains are picked up and dropped off as it visits new flowering sites. When I come down to the longhorn bee, you now see a, a pollen basket that's full. So it kind of balls up around that uh, back hind leg, if you will. Uh, the other back leg on the other side of the photo would look very similar. Uh, you can see just a little bit of that on the other side of that photo. The longhorn bees tend to be small to large in size, so 7 to 18 millimeters uh, in size. When you think of the long tongue bees, this is one of those that's a ground nester. So think about those drier environments, again, with sandy soil. Uh, this could be present in that area. This one tends to be more black with dense uh, hairs on the thorax and abdomen. Uh, you really get a good idea of those really thick, dense hair areas on this uh, photo right here. So this kind of gives you just an introductory idea of what's out in your garden with you. <coughs> what kind of entomologist would it be if I left this specimen off the presentation? Of course, we all recognize what this is. And in many presentations, people refer to this as the jerks of the insect world. I think many of us know why, don't we? Uh, they're a little bit more aggressive than some of the bees can be. Uh, that stinger, you know, they have the capability of stinging more than once if they need to. So uh, we kind of get that idea of why they're the jerks of the insect world. They actually do have pretty similar characteristics to that of bees. Uh, stinger, they have the long antennae that are present. They're going to have rather soft eyes in compared to some of the other insects. And you're going to see a photo of a fly here in a moment, and you'll just understand how much smaller that eye really is. Uh, like that of the um, mass bee, this is really a simple haired specimen, uh, not really hairy on it like you would think on most of the bees. And I talked about that narrow waist earlier. So we saw the wide waist earlier uh, on that photo. Look how narrow this gets. So that's one of those common characteristics. Uh, that's connected to that. One of the common things with this specimen, this is recognized somewhat by its nest. So this particular wasp species actually makes its nest from mud or paper. It can hang on the side of buildings or trees. Uh, please keep in mind there are other species of wasp in the area. Some of them can be ground dwelling. So I'm just showing you one example here. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind. Next, I want to get into the flies. You, you know, when I think about flies, oftentimes I think of mosquitoes probably jump into my mind first. And as someone who had West Nile in my life, that's probably the first thing that comes up. But these are a little bit different. These like to follow a little bit of mimicry. The first thing that jumps out to me is that general yellow and black predator warning coloration. We see that right away. It's not just the color they mimic, it's their behavior. Uh, this specimen has the ability to buzz kind of like a bumblebee when it's at the landscaping sites when it's pollinating. One thing I like to talk about is the difference between flies and wasp and bees. And there is one big difference, and this is sometimes hard to notice unless they're at rest. Two versus four wings. When I look at this specimen, we have the surfid fly right here, family surfidae. I see one large wing. I come down, we have one large wing, so we have one pair. If I come down to family uh, Bumbility, uh, the bee, also known as the hoverfly, you see one large wing, on the other side one large wing. So now we have one pair or two wings. If I take a step back, I'm actually going to go back another one to get a better photo of this, we're going to actually have 
four wings or two pairs. So we have that generic large front wing, but we actually have a smaller back wing that's there too, okay? This side of it will have that same uh, outlook on it as well. So the bees and the wasp are gonna have two pairs or four wings. The flies are really gonna have one pair or two wings, okay? I also talked about the eye, uh, how large in size. You can see this has a pretty small head overall, but I can see this is probably taking up half of that head. I mean, you have one on each side, really just leaving a small area in the middle. So you can just understand just how much bigger those really are. The bee fly takes an interesting coloration. It's more golden in color. Uh, it doesn't have that striping pattern that we've come accustomed to. Uh, it kind of has that large bare spot on the back of the thorax kind of stretching into the abdomen. This well fly or hover, pardon me, uh, that's where it kind of gets that secondary common name as the hover fly. Uh, the one thing that's interesting about this specimen is really the vein coverage. When I look at this specimen on the flower, I see the veins moving throughout that wing and there's quite a few of them. There are other specimens where it's a lot more heavily veined. But when I come down to this one, this is really limited in the vein coverage that we really see there. So just another one of those characteristics that can help you ID this specimen um, if it's at rest. I always like to deal with the multitasking and this is actually a GIF. Uh, this is a GIF that goes through several different animations. It's not working on this or particular presentation, but uh, it kind of gives the idea of multitasking. So walking and texting at the same time. I guess just looking at this photo, you get an idea about what's to happen, don't you? When I think of multitasking, this is kind of what I think of, at least for myself. I'm better at concentrating on one item at a time rather than trying to do two because sometimes it might have a consequence that you can feel like walking into the side of this bus stop right here. And so just one of those uh, um, multitasking things that I think about. But insects are really different. There are many insects that are actually multitasking without really realizing that they're doing it. And I'm thinking about many of our beneficial insects. When I think of beneficial, they're an insect that's out there eating some of the pest insects in the garden. But as they work, you better believe they're pollinators too. They're moving pollen grains around plant to plant. So where do I want to start here? I want to start with the lacewing. I moved here to North Central North Dakota about three years ago, and I'm not sure there's any specimen here that I've seen a higher population of than this particular specimen. Uh, first of all, I'm the one I've really visualized is the green lacewing. This is the one I've seen in very high numbers. We also have the brown lacewing. Uh, you can see that specimen there. They're both found here in parts of North Dakota. Uh, the green one is about three quarters of an inch long. The brown one a little smaller, really no bigger than a half an inch. Traditionally, golden to red color eyes with net like wings. What makes them so beneficial is they're a general predator. You can see there feeding on aphids, leaf hoppers, white flies, mites, just to name a few of them. I always like this uh, stat right here. The larvae have been observed to feed 200 aphids per week. 200 aphids per week. I think that's a pretty considerable number to think about in any ag or horticulture setting. Uh, one thing to take note, uh, adults and larvae have pretty similar diets. Uh, and in times of drought, it is not unusual for that adult to turn to nectar and pollen to feed on uh, when some of the pest populations are under stress. <laughs> the butterflies uh, and moths. I always put this in just for a quick thing. We all know they're pollinators. Uh, this one's a little bit different, though. Some of the beneficial comes just from the beauty. A lot, across the globe, they're recognized for their beauty. There's many different types of butterflies, many different shades and colors, and that's one of the benefits we see from them. We see diurnal there. It's day active, and you see that bright color. How does that bright color the blend in with the landscaping areas it's visiting? Moths, on the other hand, kind of drabby in appearance. They had that bright orange color. It stands out at night to predators. So kind of has that reverse impact. Uh, again, adults, nectar feeders can pollinate, picking up pollens of grain on that hairy chest as it moves from plant to plant. One of the interesting things about butterflies is a lot of people don't realize they have scales. A scale's like a snake. So if I bring this next photo up, this gives you a zoomed up photo of what that looks like, okay? Shingles on a roof, scales on a reptile. It kind of looks the same. It allows moisture to roll off the back a little bit quicker, allows it to dry quicker uh, if it gets moisture on it. That's because they want to lose weight so they can fly a little bit better. 
However, as good as they can be, they can be the pest insect in the garden too, can't they? Thinking about the immature stage, thinking about the caterpillar, there's about a seven, 10, 12 day period where they're using the tree mouth parts and they feed on the leaves and on different types of plants. So when you're in your garden, think about, is it okay if there's some damage from caterpillars? They're only gonna be here a week, a week and a half, maybe a few days longer, or can I pick them up, move them to another site where they're not gonna be impactful in my garden? <coughs> then I wanted to put up the ladybug. Uh, back in Nebraska, I worked on soybean aphids in my master's degree, and ladybug became a large part of my scouting program. They're often recognized by just about everyone by either size, general appearance, and shape, or coloration, right? One thing that most are not familiar with is the immature specimen. So if I bring up the immature specimen, uh, uh, we always say this is the alligator-shaped specimen or the immature. No more than a half an inch long, black and green appearance with yellow or orange spots on the back. So this gives you a big idea of what this is. So why is this important? Because both the adult and the larvae are fierce uh, beneficial insects. If I come to that bottom line there, you see 300 aphids per day can be fed on by these specimens. When I think about my master's degree, I worked in soybean, Soybean aphid economic threshold is 250 aphids per plant. Well, if one adult can do 300 aphids per day, it kind of gives you the idea that maybe we don't need to be spraying chemical yet. Maybe this population is strong enough that I can come back in 48 hours and this population will be knocked down. And I have seen that time and time again in many situations. So when you're scouting the bad insects, make sure you're doing the good ones as well. And there's several different types of pollinators here. So think of wildlife, bats, birds, your pets, even yourself can be a pollinator. So think about that as well. So just to begin to wrap up, it looks like I'm kind of out on time. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this slide up as we move into the question section uh, of this presentation. So uh, if there's any questions out there, I'd be happy to take those. Okay, Travis, thank you. And we have a few minutes here for questions. How about uh, what can you do to attract pollinators to a high tunnel? Uh, to what? To what? A high okay, tunnel. so uh, think about for pollinators, really want to evaluate whatever environment that you're really in. Okay, so first of all, remember pollinators are. Um, living organism. So make sure they have all the resources that they need in a given area. We often think about the landscaping as one of those resources because we think about the pollen and the nectar they may feed on. Also think about other things. Think about water. Does it have a water source in that area? And then think about the plants you have in that area. Uh, there are some really amazing landscaping out there that I have seen. The one thing you want to tie in is in any landscaping garden is to make sure you're including native plants. Think about North Dakota, for example. If I went 10 miles south of Minot 50 years ago, did it look very much like it does now? The answer is probably not. Uh, right now we have a lot more agriculture that is developed in those areas. But what we probably saw if there's a tall grass prairie. So think about some of the native plants that they were associated with, their ancestors, kind of were raised around those relationships. They know how to interact with those plants. When I think about where we're at now, I go out into the countryside. We've introduced a lot of new crops that may or may not be native. So we're trying to force them to have a relationship with plants that may or may not be there. So in those situations, just think about what you're planting. Uh, make sure you have some of the native plants with there. Uh, oftentimes, there's some new modern hybrids and stuff like that. That's all fine and dandy to have there. Just make sure you're including some of those natives. Okay, and TJ will look forward to your uh, brief uh, answers here. Uh, how about, is uh, are wasps and hornets the same? Wasp and hornets are similar, uh, not necessarily the same. Uh, they have similar behaviors, uh, but it'll be just at the species level, there'll be a little bit of a difference. 
but again, kind of the same interaction and behaviors in a given environment. How do we prevent bees from building mud nests on the east side of a brick house? So I assume we're actually talking about wasp and not bees when we're thinking about that. So really, it's going to think about the environment that you have there. So sometimes it's just disrupting that environment. Maybe you make it a little bit warmer. Oftentimes you don't see it on the west side of the house. Sometimes maybe it means you go out there and you have to knock it down. There's not going to be a sure way of preventing it, but if you knock it down a few times, they're really not going to be encouraged to rebuild it again. How can we attract ladybugs? How do you attract ladybugs? Well, that's actually an interesting thought. So attracting ladybugs is actually dependent on the pest populations in your area. Populations tend to rise when you have a higher concentration of ladybug or of pests, pardon me. So that's really what's going to bring them in because there's a food source there. Uh, so that's really going to be how you do it. There's not a sure set way beyond that. It's just having that food source present. So you have to attract pests into your garden. Is that it? And that's something we don't want as landscapers, right? <laughs> How about, uh, how can you discourage ground dwelling bees from around your home, especially when swarming becomes a problem? So discouraging them again is really going to fall to your environment. So I guess this will be a two part answer. So part one, think about where your landscaping is and in that landscape, make sure you have bare areas as a part of that because that is likely going to be the area that is going to attract a colony to start so if you have a landscaping area away from that house or the uh, building that you don't want it there that's something to consider uh, for having that on the other hand think about the moisture environment we've talked about in many of these kind of a drier environment so maybe it's as simple as keeping that area a little bit more moist uh, so that's just really one suggestion there so it's just changing that environment from what you have now. Okay, what role do the male bees play? Keep it clean. So, okay, so male bees actually are not present in the colony all year long. They tend to surface towards the end of the growing season, uh, especially uh, here in North Dakota. They surface really to help fertilize that queen, right? Uh, beyond that, they really don't serve a huge purpose in that colony. So it will be to help that colony survive to the next growing season. Thank you. How about explain the difference between a ladybug and the soybean beetle that invades our home every fall? <laughs> so I'm trying to think of which soybean beetle because there's actually several of them that do. Uh, the soybean leaf beetle, I've actually yet to come across here in North Dakota. So, uh, but there are other beetles that come in and really the big difference, there'll be some in coloration. Uh, so t some of the soybean beetles tend to be more of a green, olive green uh, with those black ladybug like spots. Of course, think about the regular ladybug more orange or red in color. Uh, so that's kind of the differences. Some of them are going to be more of plant feeders. The ladybug, of course, is going to be a pest feeder or beneficial insect. How do we get rid of bees that are in the walls of the house? <laughs> Getting them out of the walls of a house. Well, <laughs> that can be an interesting process. So. The best way to do that, I kind of feel like a broken record. There, one, you really can't get in and alter that environment easily, can you? you? You can't alter the heat, you can't alter the moisture. So really what you're doing or thinking about in that consideration is, what am I dealing with here? And I'm thinking about a mud wasp here. So they're gonna be active during the day away from that nest that may be the time to interact with that nest. So maybe you're able to uh, lunge a little bit of a stick in there and pull it out. They shouldn't really be there as they're out pollinating. You really want to avoid the early morning and that evening time as they begin to return back to that area. Uh, things like raid uh, and shot some of those chemicals can be beneficial in that time period as well. 
uh, but you just have to make sure you're coding that nest when you're uh, aiming for that. Uh, let's talk about uh, Asian multicolor lady beetle. How can you tell the difference of that and the uh, standard ladybug? <laughs> okay, so keeping in mind this is kind of a general answer. So the first one that you can notice is more of the general ones we're accustomed to tend to be a little bit more red uh, as we get to more to the Asian lady beetle, a little bit more orange. But there is a little bit of wash each direction, okay? That's going to be one. The second one is going to be a behavior one. When I think of the native ladybug, it does not tend to congregate in crevices or tight cracks, especially later in the fall or right now in the early spring as they're coming out of that winter slumber. That is something that we see from the Asian lady beetle. They're searching out warm areas to survive the winter. So you see that large congregation. Another difference is the Asian lady beetle can bite. The red one traditionally does not. Uh, I always think about in the fall, and I know many of you probably experienced this as well. Many of you probably hang clothes out on a clothesline. As we get later in the day, it starts cooling off. They actually congregate in the clothes that you have on the line, and you may fold them up. So when you smash them or fold them up, they actually stain. Uh, so they can have a big impact. But there's going to be a little bit of the color, but mainly you're going to look at that behavior. That will be the big way of identifying the two. TJ, if we do target the Asian uh, multicolor lady beetle, are we also at risk of killing the more beneficial ladybugs? Yes, you are. So they're going to have the same uh, chemistries that attack them. And my first response to anyone who would say, can I spray to kill these off? I would say, why? Because yes, they're a little bit more of a nuisance, but they perform the exact same benefits as the normal ladybug. So do we really need to go down that route to control them? Because uh, really that nuisance will go away as we start to get to that freezing mark. In your one of your slides, you talked about the long-tongued solitary bee. Is that, mm -hmm. is, it, is that right? Or is it a long-horned solitary bee? So in my slides, I talked about the long-tongued uh, solitary bees. OK. Just want to make sure these gardeners want to keep you on your toes here. Yep. yep. How about uh, do you recommend insect motels? Uh, so yes, I do recommend uh, insect hotels. And keep in mind, those are going to be for the solitary bees, not for the uh, colony bees. Those will be for the solitary bees. Uh, you'll notice on the handouts I gave you uh, behind my question slide, I put two extra recommended sources. One of them comes from the University of Nebraska. Uh, you can actually search for that just using UNL B Hotel. Uh, they've gone to, into expense, extensive research. What should it look like? What, how we should make it and stuff like that. But we do know, especially if you have the right environmental settings where you place it, you know that we do know it's going to work. Uh, I've The one here at the North Central Research Extension Center has actually been on TV a few times. Uh, showing the activity coming back and forth. So refer to that uh, info guide. It'll talk about depths and diameters, and we do see a population boost from them. So that's a great tool to have. Okay, TJ, do weed and feed lawn fertilizers kill honeybees or other pollinating insects or birds? Do fertilize, fertilizers kill insects? So I'm not 100% sure on this of anything that I've been observant with. I've not come into that where we're seeing an impact from that. Um, but I'm guessing if you put high levels of fertilizer, you're kind of getting away from that rate label. Would it surprise me? Probably not. Uh, that's probably the best answer I can give. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head otherwise. Okay. Can we encourage bumblebees by creating some sort of tunnel environment over the winter? So that is an interesting question. And actually, that is something that there is research going on right now. Uh, so think about the bee hotels, the above ground ones. They're actually doing research right now on building ones, building a small shoebox size one, uh, sometimes smaller, burying it underground and giving it a little bit of a hose as a tunnel. They're kind of burying that hose as well, just leaving the outside of it. So the real answer to that is we don't know yet, but there's a lot of experiments happening. 
Uh, if you follow Bumble Boosters on Facebook, you're going to see this is not just a UNL Nebraska project. This is a citizen science project where normal citizens around the globe are talking about what they did, what they saw, and what those results look like. Okay, TJ, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And that brings this, this year's Spring Fever Garden Forums to an end. Please, everybody, complete the evaluation form so we can keep this program going better and better. And also, this is the end of the forums, but this is just the beginning of the gardening season. And so your local county extension office is there to support you all spring, summer, and fall. So everybody have a great year. And if NDSU Extension is always there to support your efforts. So thank you, everybody. Have a great year.